Hi there, and welcome to the Praying Christian Women podcast. I'm Jamie Hampton, and I get to be here today with our good friend and Praying Christian Women uh, partner in crime, Becky Kopitsky. Becky, thank you for joining us. Hi, Jamie. I'm so happy to be here. This is really going to be so much fun. Me too. So today we're going to be talking about Becky's book called Love Because, How to Change the World One Blessing at a Time. And Becky, I have to tell you that I love this. And Alana and I kind of laughed at this because how to change the world one blessing at a time. So even like before you were part of the Praying Christian Women team, um, like our tagline was changing the world one prayer at a time. So <laughs> it was just meant to be. It's it like meant great, to be. <laughs> great minds think alike. Yes. Um, well, Becky, so Becky has been, she, she's written books, she's author, speaker, ministry extraordinaire, um, but we're going to kind of focus in on this particular book right now, um, just because it's, I mean, this is a, a book that's so timely, and t for me, like I told you before we started recording, Becky, it just gives me a lot of hope that in a world where it seems like we're more divided than ever, and there's more negativity than ever, I just feel like this book tells us that we in in the sphere of influence that we have which feels small to us and sometimes insignificant we can make world changing difference just right where we are so i love this so thank you for writing this book thank you that blesses me so much this is a book that's very near and dear to my heart and i i myself needed this book you know anytime content creators, authors, speakers, deliver a message. It's largely built from their own experience and need. And this one is no exception for me. I really recognize that I needed to get better at loving the people around me. So I just dug into scripture to learn, how do I do that? Right? How do we do that? Because <laughs> yeah. God actually does give us quite a few instructions and encouragements in scripture. It's just, we get derailed often in our own lives, don't we? <laughs> yeah. Well, I love, one, one of the things I love about this book is in addition to being so full of scripture, it's also full of these personal anecdotes about real people to just give us this picture of what could this look like in my life. And I couldn't stop reading it. And <laughs> we had a delay with me. Like I, I normally take a little bit more time to, to prepare before interviews. And I pretty much read it last night and I started skimming. And then I was like, I got sucked in. So I couldn't skim anymore because of these story after story about your life, about people, you know, and it is just so, and then just the applications of each thing um, yeah. that you talk about is just really awesome. But before I'm tempted to get sucked into just talking about the book, but before we do, we usually do. So our question that we normally ask that, that our listeners know is, you know, what's your favorite prayer closet? Where do you go to connect with God? But we've talked to you recently and we got that answer. So I yeah. wanted to know, um, to switch things up a little, what is your biggest prayer challenge? And then what do you love most about prayer? Mm, so for someone who writes and speaks about mm -hmm. God's power, I am going to be very vulnerable and ashamed to admit that's that truly for me, my biggest prayer challenge is, it, is believing that the God of the universe is actually listening to me. I know this in my head. I know it. I tell it to other people, but often my heart doesn't quite get that message. And, and the enormity of that truth, it's almost, it, it's, it's so unfathomable that the God who created the entire universe would humble himself to listen to me, right? And I know it's true and I know he does, but sometimes I, I, I struggle to be talking with him, realizing he's actually listening to me or, or, um, you know, these, these requests aren't that important. And so I need to constantly be going back to the word and reminding myself that God is listening and, and actively involved, which is why the thing I love most about prayer is when God gives us the gift of seeing an, a prayer answered, yeah. because it's that reminder that he did hear, he is actively involved, even though he's not a tangible force in my life at the moment, he is the, the strongest force, right? Mm -hmm. Just because I can't touch him, see him, hear him audibly talk to me, doesn't mean that he's not more active than anything else in, in my life. And when he, we get to see that through answered prayer, that to me is the greatest gift. That's what I love about it. And when God allows us to see that, because he doesn't have to, we don't deserve it. He doesn't owe us anything when we ask for a prayer. We may never see it answered in our lifetime. 
But when he gives us the gift of getting to see that, I just, that to me is payday. I love it. I I had kind of a hard conversation with my daughter, with our daughter mm -hmm. the other night where, you know, she's 10 and honestly, like my other, my other two, I would say have had more intellectual questions about the Bible and more like spiritual conversations at a younger age. She's yeah. just now kind of coming around to that. I don't know personality or just, but I realized in this conversation, just how much she has in there that she just hasn't brought up. And one of her things was, do you ever feel like maybe God doesn't love you as much as he loves other people because you just keep asking for the same thing and it doesn't ever happen and i'm like oh so hard oh my heart just oh yeah. and part yeah. of me was just like why haven't you asked this sooner and why haven't i talked to you about this more yeah. you know here i am prayer podcast we talk about prayer all the time and my daughter and I haven't had this particular conversation because I didn't think she was thinking it because she hadn't shared that particular yeah. thing. But for all of us, it reflects the heart. I think no matter how long we've been Christians or how much we've talked it over, there's always that inside, like, does he really hear me? Or does it matter that I ask this if he's already decided it? And you yes. answer, I mean, you address, I won't say answer, you address a lot of these questions in your book. So, right. um, you know, you've got a lot of, a lot of very basic, important, deep questions in this book. So for me, it was timely because I got to revisit some of that and talk through some of those things by reading this book um, that I would love to, you know, then go back and talk with with our daughter back, you know. Yeah, about. and those are tough truths that even as adults we grapple with, right? Yeah. And so to be able to break those down in a way that a 10-year-old can understand and accept, that's the challenge of motherhood, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Yeah. And not feeling like you have to protect God either, because there's so many times I feel like I have to somehow, you know, it sounds laughable, but that I have to protect God or his reputation with my yes. kids, because then I'm like, well, God, you knew she was asking for these things. Why wouldn't you just give it to her to prove that you're real? Yes, right. We want to protect his reputation as the good guy, yeah. even though what we are, what what our children are asking for, if he's saying no or wait, then clearly it's not his will for them. So why would right. we want for them Right. what he's saying is not his will for them? Oh, it's such a mess, isn't it? It is. Yeah, I hear you. I it hear is. you. I think through through those experiences, we moms need to learn to trust just as much as our kids do. Yeah, it's it's definitely mm -hmm. a reminder that our children are ours on loan. And yes. ultimately, their relationship with him, no matter what we do, it's still between the two of them. And, yeah. and I think that's where we can come alongside and pray for them. And I'm so glad that she voiced that. So we can talk about it. So I can share my experiences with her as someone who's walked with God longer and, you know, be able to know how to pray for her better. So, yeah. yeah. Oh, so, I hear you. so was your answer about what you love most about prayer that God gives us those glimpses or did you have something different? Yes. No, that was really the, okay. the first thing that, that I was, thought of is, yeah. it, I mean, what a gift is that, right? I mean, there is how many is. things do we all love about prayer, right? But the, the fact that sometimes he will give us a glimpse into his answer. Yeah. It's just so cool. That's why it's helpful it. to have a prayer journal so we can go back in those moments when we're thinking, why aren't you answering this one? Mm -hmm. And remember when he answered previously. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what inspired you to write this book, Love Because, and who did you kind of have in mind as your, your target audience for the book? Really who I have in mind is Christian women who want to love their people well, their own families, their, their own friends and neighbors, but also others in their community. Want to do that well, really want to reflect Jesus, but we just get sidetracked, right? We're, we're, we're busy. We start thinking self but what really inspired me to write it was a conversation I was having with a dear friend of mine. This was several years ago now, but um, her name is Erin. And Erin had just lost her husband in a very uh, tragic experience suddenly. And I, we were visiting. This is a few months after she had lost him. And she was just telling me about their marriage, how they didn't know the last year of their marriage was going to be the last year, of course. Mm -hmm. But she was telling me how they had started doing kind things for each other. 
he would, um, you know, open a door for her and then she would make his favorite meal. And they just started reciprocating these kindnesses to each other. And the word that she used is she said, it was like we were trying to outbless each other. And that just really stuck with me, the idea of outblessing someone. And what if the whole world operated that way, where we're not just thinking about ourselves, but we're thinking about what can I do for this other person I'm in this relationship with, whether it's a marriage relationship, your children, your friends, what can I do to go beyond and outbless someone, to go beyond what is expected of me and to try to, not in a competitive spirit, but in a spirit of, of, generous love, to love this person more than is actually required of me. And that's what shows Jesus to us, to one another. So, and, and, I, and, and I realized in that moment that I was not doing that well with my own family. So I started digging into it and I wanted to know what does scripture say about this? How do I do this better? And that's really where the book was born. That is great. And it is, but, and it is just these, um, I don't know, I feel like we get derailed by, you know, becoming jaded, becoming yeah. cynical, um, and, and just being practical even like, well, I don't, I don't have time. No you know, time. you feel like I don't, I don't have time for this. I just think to your example about the coffee mug, could you share that story <laughs> about like the conclusions yes. you came to that would, that hit home for me. Yeah, I well, the story is one day I got home. I'm as normal, right? Normal, the normal, busy, hectic morning. Mm -hmm. I had dropped my kids off at school. I came home. I worked from home. I had to get to my desk. I had a pile of to dos, and I stopped in the kitchen just to probably grab myself something to eat and head into my office. And I saw my husband's coffee mug sitting at the side of the sink and was unwashed, and it was hand wash only. And so <laughs> my first thought is. Oh, that's his travel mug. He can take care of it. That's his deal. I don't even drink the coffee in the house, right? I only drink coffee if it's from a barista. <laughs> it's got lots of chocolate in it. But, you know, he was a coffee pot at home kind of guy. And here's his travel mug sitting there dirty. And I thought, I am standing right by the sink. I could wash this for him so that it's ready for the next time he wants to use it. Or I could just go about my day because I don't have time. But how much time was it really going to take? So I just got to thinking about... What would it require of me to do a simple kindness for my husband, the person that I love the most of all the people in the universe, right? But well, I didn't have 30 seconds for him to wash his travel mug, but what would it say if I did? Mm -hmm. And so those types of things just made me start to realize how often do I overlook those opportunities? It was a simple 30 second scrub of this mug and it showed him I was thinking about you. Right? Yeah. This is important to you. And I was thinking about you and I wanted to serve you and help you. It was no real sacrifice, but how many of those little sacrifices do we overlook and that eventually can pile up to erode a marriage? Whereas if we were to take advantage of those opportunities, they could pile up to bless and grow a marriage or any other relationship. So Absolutely. that was the root of that yeah. story. Well, and it even, I mean, it's not like he would have a negative response. It sounded in the book like you guys kind of had an agreement. He took care of that. You took care of other yeah. stuff, you know, that it wouldn't have spoken negatively. It wouldn't have been a message that you were sending like, ooh, do your own dishes. No, it, no, no. He, he expected have taken, to wash his own mug. He expected to wash it, right? Mm -hmm. But but like you said, it's like the, it's not that that action was revolutionary, but it, it's, it's the sum total of... It, it, um, it starts to create a storyline. I, I just think it like yeah. in our, our lives sort of as having narratives. And so the narrative that you're starting to write is like, I do spontaneous kind things for you because I love you. Like that's, yeah. and, and if you do that more and more, that becomes a foundation of your marriage and who you are and who he is to you. And that's yeah. the story that he has, even if he doesn't consciously even realize it the first time he sees it or ever, it's like, it, it just builds. And I, I just love that. And that was humbling to me yeah. as someone who so often I just get caught up in the day to day and, and not even thinking yeah. along those lines of building on a foundation one way well, or another. You're, you're just 
you just said it, Jamie, that's exactly the point is that we get ourselves into these routines mm -hmm. of keeping our eyes closed mm -hmm. to the opportunities in front of us. So it really requires a shift in vision, a shift in recognizing what could I do? What is within grasp that doesn't even take that much time or effort that I can do to bless the people around me? And it's it's mm -hmm. a matter of looking beyond ourselves it's a new, it's a new, it's a mind shift. It's a new way of looking at the world essentially. And in a way, taking your thoughts captive for Christ, because my th thoughts are also, are often focused on me, what mm -hmm. I have to get done. You know, what, even if it's not, I, I'm only thinking about me and what's in it for me. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying, what do I have to do today? I have to serve my clients. I have to check emails. I have to write that check to school. So even if the thoughts that I have are the, my to do's are related to serving other people, those that list really prevents me from looking beyond what I think is my task for the day yeah. and recognizing other opportunities that are out there that are never going to make my to-do list, but I can easily add them. Yeah. And just so I have a confession. So the day, <laughs> so last night I, it was, I think it was, I think it was last night. It was either last night or the night before, but it was just before I read your book at some 24 hours before, <laughs> within the 24 hours before reading your book, um, I went into the gas station. Um, I came back out. I just had to use the ATM and I came back out and there was someone who potentially homeless, potentially just sitting there with mm -hmm. like a small suitcase with just like basically kind of huddled up. It's been very cold, very, very cold in mm -hmm. Anchorage, Alaska, um, for the last few weeks, like negative temperatures. Um, we do have places, warming buildings, places for people to go. We do have some shelters. We have, you know, we, we do have places that people can go for services. Um, but I saw this person and I was in such a hurry. I was already running late, stopping to get the money for the hockey game that we were going to was not on my list and I was already a little bit late. So I zoomed in, I zoomed out. I recognized that the person was there. I intentionally didn't make eye contact. Um, and I'm, I'm, I would say that historically I've been a person that hates the idea of passing someone by without smiling, at least, even if I don't have money to give them, even if I don't believe that it's the right thing to do to give them money, you know, which, right. Right. I go back and forth on all the time. Yeah. Um, and I just, it haunted me. It haunted me. And then I, I get there and I'm reading your book and I'm reading a story about one of the, the people in the book that, you know, basically prayed with a homeless person, which yeah. just, you know, I, I just realized it was just an illustration of, okay, there is logic that has gotten me to a point of feeling cynical, feeling like, why don't you go somewhere that is established to help you? Um, and over the years, seeing people potentially not being grateful for steps that you take to help them or yeah. misusing what you've given them, all of those things, it's built up in me. And, and I'm not saying that I'm always a no make eye contact person. Cause I typically am not, I'll at least do something or smile or whatever. But this particular time I absolutely passed by my heart was hardened. And as I was reading your book, I was just broken. I was like, who knows what I'm not necessarily, I don't have to give that person money if I don't think that it's the right thing to do, but maybe God wants me to, I didn't even ask God what he wanted me to do. I didn't even think to stop and say, do I have a divine appointment here or not? But yeah. no matter what, looking at that person in the eye, saying hello, acknowledging them as a human and potentially praying with them or for them or potentially just showing kindness, um, that can have eternal impact in the life of someone who's at rock bottom. Yeah. They may it's never who... forget a small act of kindness. So that, yeah. you know, I'll, I'll probably never see that person again. Um, but it did reading your book really made me realize that I cannot miss any opportunity to show kindness to someone, no matter what their circumstance, no matter what my ideas are of what, what they have available to them or not. I don't know their story. 
but I need to go to God and say, Lord, you know their story. What, what can I do to show the love of Jesus to this person in this moment? Right. And like you said, it may just be acknowledging their dignity. Yes. Right. Yeah. There, there are, are, there's a certain posture we can have toward others that, um, is counter counter cultural really i would say right now culture is and has been for a long time very me focused and that is often what seeps into our own even our christian lives and makes it difficult for us to look beyond ourselves and to, mm-hmm. to see other people I, I think hospitality isn't valued like it used to be um i think there are a lot of you know, as you are sort of alluding to jamie a lot of political arguments about you know What is our role really when services are offered and and what is, you know, am I enabling? And there are so many questions that come to mind when you see someone who is in need. Mm -hmm. But when we go back to the core of what is my responsibility to another human being, it's to see them as God's created child. And that costs nothing. Yeah. It costs nothing. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Well, you kind of touched on this, but what would you say are some of the unique barriers to kindness that we're facing here now in the 21st century? Yeah. Well, there's a lot of entitlement. I think it's just, especially in the United States, so much is about uh, look at me, who are my followers, who, you know, who, how, what do I possess? And so selfishness is inherent in our culture and we're not really a look to others culture or care for others culture so much Mm -hmm. even in in terms of you know how we we as a society value the elderly you know there are cultures where the elderly are are held in the highest regard and in here in you know in the united states uh it's not that way so very much it's we we um i think we glorify youth and um and fame and success and because of that Kindness gets kicked to the wayside because we focus so much on that idea of what's in it for me. What's in it for me versus what's in it for somebody else. It's very difficult to open your eyes to care for someone else when you are inwardly focused on what's in this for me. So it really requires a culture shift away from me first. And we all fall prey to it. You know, it's not like there's some um, nebulous me focused, um, you know, a big brother out there saying you cannot think about other people. It's just, it's in everything. It's in our media. It's in the messaging that we hear. It's in the attitudes of the people around us. And, and that is, a, that requires some serious emotional surgery, right? To, mm-hmm. to take a look at ourselves and say, how much are we absorbing from culture versus from what scripture says, how scripture says we should look at another person. And those two things are, are, depending on i suppose uh, what your priorities are where you where you live who your company what who's the company that you keep those two things can be polar opposites what scripture says and what your culture is telling you to do so for me i realized that a lot of my my own attitudes were rooted in selfishness in ways that i didn't even acknowledge or wasn't even aware of I was thinking, well, I'm a Christian. I love other people until I really took a close look at how I handle my time and how I handle my attitudes, uh, how I handle my propensity toward judgment on other people. It's an entire internal shift in the way we view others because we cannot be kind to people that we aren't respecting or aren't thinking about in the first place. Yeah. I love the example that you give about uh excuse me i love the example that you give about um the becky version of a conversation so i think (laughs) this goes right along the lines of what you're talking about and i think in our digital age where we're texting a lot and things can be taken differently than they're intended there even but you give the example in face to face conversation with your husband but yes like misunderstandings can happen so easily virtually even more so but can you give an example just kind of like tell us what that's about the becky translation <laughs> the, 
<laughs> the Becky translation of, of a conversation has gotten yeah. me in trouble so, so many times, and I continue to work on it. It's probably uh, the biggest source of contention in my marriage. <laughs> I say that kindly. So I will hear a word spoken from my husband. We'll talk, you know, it can happen in any relationship, but I'm talking about marriage, right? So I will hear a word spoken from him and interpret it the way that I believe he means it and often take offense. It, so he means it kindly. I will translate that in a manner that takes offense. So for example, this was quite some time ago now, but one of the examples that always comes to mind for me is the day that not even words he says, but actions, actions and words, right? I drove into our garage and I see a tennis ball hanging from the rafters. And immediately I think, he thinks I don't know how to park the car. He thinks that I am parking too close to the garbage cans. He thinks that I'm an idiot and I have no clue how to park my own stinking minivan. And so I go tearing into the house. What's with the ball hanging from the rafters? And he said, well, I thought it would be helpful to you because I know you were telling me you weren't quite sure how to position the, the van. It was a, we had the new minivan at the time. I, you weren't quite sure how to position it inside the garage. So I thought I was helping you. <laughs> he genuinely, genuinely thought that he was helping me. Yes. He, in, in which case he really was, he meant to be helpful, but I immediately translated his actions as offense, which put me on the defensive. And this is how it goes for us, right? He'll say something to me, like the example I use in the book is he was telling me he thought maybe the pasta was done cooking and he thought, and he knows I don't like soggy pasta. So he's thinking I'm being helpful. I'm telling my wife when it's time to take the pot off the stove to which I hear you're an idiot. You don't know how to cook pasta. <laughs> So I will respond according to the translation that I have created in my mind, rather than responding to what he actually meant. Yes. And so that creates all sorts of problems because we cannot be kind when we're on the defensive. So, I mean, do you ever do that, Jamie? Am I the only one? I was cracking <laughs> up silently so that it wouldn't disrupt your, your story, but I also have a tennis ball. My and put it's meant as garage. a sign of love, isn't it? Isn't that exactly yeah. how you look at it? But I do the exact he same thing <laughs> where I translate. And I don't know if the tennis ball, because I just acknowledge that I'm spatially challenged. So it didn't bother me because I was like, oh, thank goodness. Now I'm not going to always get it wrong. But, oh, my goodness. Here's the thing. I know I'm spatially challenged and I still took offense. <laughs> yeah. But there are other things where and it's with 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 our husbands, with our friends, with our social media acquaintances with whatever, where the other thing is that distance from the person even makes it worse. Because not only do you have the misinterpretation of what they're trying to say, or maybe you're interpreting it correctly, either way, but when they're not there face to face, you start creating these stories in your mind. And like, having fake, okay, maybe I'm the only one, having fake conversations in your head with All this the time. person <laughs> that you think this is what they're thinking and so many times I'm wrong. And yes. then so many times when I come face to face with a person, immediately that angst is diffused. And I'm like, oh, I was wrong. There's nothing between yes. us like that. That was silly. But yeah. because of the distance, you know, because there's just a text going on or because, you know, there wasn't an exclamation point at the end of the sentence and you don't <laughs> picture them smiling when they're saying it. You're like, are they mad at me? Oh, my goodness. What did I do? You know, yes. so I don't know. It's just um, it's very hard. Um, it's hard enough face to face, but it it's is, but very hard right. not face to face. So, yeah. And we do, we, it, it, we have to take those thoughts captive, right? Because yes. I can, I can create rifts and end entire relationships in my brain, right? Without actually having a conversation with the other person. <laughs> yes. Well, and that was my next question. What do we do? And I think that's the perfect answer. Take your thoughts captive and make them obedient to Christ. So what would that look like for you? Like what, what would you suggest for someone that's just like, I do this all the time. I'm always making up stories, but I don't know how to stop. It's a simple flip of the switch from presuming poor intentions to presuming good intentions. Mm -hmm. I'm reminding myself, especially in my marriage, all the time, my husband is my teammate. He's not my enemy. He's right. not on the opposing team. And what does that mean? Teammates work together. They work for each other. They support each other. They're not adversaries. So 
presume good intentions, take that thought captive, flip it and say, how could this have been meant for good? If this person has good intentions toward me, if this person cares for me, how could I interpret that in that type of a light versus the negative light? And it is a practice. It's a, it's a discipline. I have to be retraining my brain all the time to consider how does, how do I interpret this from a positive perspective versus a negative one? And it makes all the difference. My husband can use the exact same words and I can interpret that as cruelty or ultimate kindness, depending on how I choose to look at it from his perspective. But it's always a choice. It's always a choice we make, right? And and First Corinthians tells us, you know, in the, in the, the love chapter to give people the benefit of the doubt. Don't presume that what they're telling you is negative. Give them the benefit of the doubt. And, and I'm terrible at that, Yeah, which is why I need to practice it. Yeah, make it a habit, make it a discipline. Yeah. (laughs) Well, and, you know, I feel like even if their intention was snarky, or their intention was what you think it was, if you assume the best, you're breaking the cycle. And so, you know, like when what, like, uh, I just had to look it up, but Proverbs 15, one, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. That gentle word, and I keep I tell my kids this all the time, and I need to take it to heart no matter what the other person says or does or what their intention is, if you respond to that with kindness, if you respond to that with giving them the benefit of the doubt, nine times out of 10, it breaks the cycle of bad feelings and it causes them to turn instead of you getting sucked in and just both of you spiraling in this, you know, I picture Mm -hmm. um, Gandalf and the Balrog in Lord of the Rings, just like (laughs) fighting it out and going deeper and deeper into the pit. Um, You you break that cycle and you turn the other person to kindness. It's happened to me when I've been on the wrong side, Mm -hmm. when someone comes back with just understanding like, oh, you know, oh, I see what you're saying or whatever, whatever it is. I I just really think that is Mm -hmm. key. So I love that. It does. And it, it makes me think, if you don't mind me sharing, Jamie, there's a, a, a story that I relay also in the book from a friend of mine, mm-hmm. and I'll make this brief, but the concept here is when we are kind to the unkind, it can help break that cycle because if we are unkind to the unkind, it only perpetuates for them this belief they have that the world is an unkind place. But mm-hmm. when we show them Christ's love in the face of their unkindness, it can break that cycle. And a, a friend of mine was um, volunteering for a school activity at her her daughter's school and was treated very rudely by the volunteer coordinator. But she chose instead that she was going to be kind to her. And so every time she passed her in the hallway, she would smile and say hello. The other moms, meanwhile, would always you know, Twitter, Twitter, Twitter in the background about how terrible this woman was, how she was not kind and and uh, how you know she was made everything difficult uh, and which she did by her own actions. However, my friend chose to show her the love of God and be kind and civil and smile. And so two years later, I think two years, they never really were working together on a project um, since the first time they met, but over two years, just her kindness in the hallway must have spoken to this woman to the point where my friend was moving. She, the loading trucks were at her doorway and her doorbell rang. And it was this woman, the volunteer coordinator from church, with tears in her eyes saying, I'm going to miss you so much. I have so enjoyed seeing you at school and working with you and having a connection with you. And my friend was floored. She said she had no idea. This woman was never anything but unkind. But the kindness that my friend showed her, undeserved, spoke to her so much that she was in tears at the idea of my friend leaving. So what does our kindness do to unkind people without us even being aware? And that was very convicting to me. Because how easy is it to say, oh, this is that, you know, here's that woman. Nobody likes that woman. Or, we, you know, this person is known for being difficult. So what do we do? We choose to look at them as difficult and repay with more difficult. But what if we flip the switch? Well, and it's also a reminder that we don't always see the fruit of what we're doing. And it's okay. Like, we need to do it for goodness sake and not for what we're going to get back. Because our tendency is to be like, oh, I will keep doing this as long as I get back recognition because it kind of makes us feel validated. Oh, I was kind and it changed this person Mm -hmm. around. But even if it doesn't, um, or even if you never see the fruit of it, I think of a time when I, I bought a homeless person a meal and handed it to them and she said, 
I hate ham. This is ham. And she was very ungrateful. <laughs> but on and, and that was one of those things, like as a young adult that I was just like, mm, OK, I mean, it yeah. didn't like deter me, but it was one of the things along the way that maybe has made me more cynical. But as I look back, I think and I hear this story and I'm like, I don't have any idea what that did to her heart. I know that she probably had experienced way more difficulty and tragedy in her life than I may ever know. And maybe that was just her outward wall inside. Mm -hmm. Who knows? That may have, she may still remember that today. Yeah. And so we cannot base whether we're kind or not on what we get back or even what we see because what's happening beneath the surface you just never know and i think that's, that's the importance true. of it's being true. sensitive to the leading of the holy spirit because yeah. when we do that it's um you know god sees he knows the the he impact does. and our motives can't be again what's in it for me it can't be the high that we get by doing some doing a good deed right right it, it's 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 got to be purer than that it has to be lord even if this person is unkind to me i will be your i will show, reflect your love to this person, even if I get nothing out of it, right? I mean, if you're if you're only giving a gift because you want the the thank you note to come, then are you really giving a gift? Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Good points. Well, there is. I have a ton more questions to talk about. We'll have to maybe get together again. But <laughs> I just, I guess, maybe as we kind of wind down, we're running out of time. Um, but. I love the 50 ways to bless through your prayers. Could you just highlight maybe a couple that are some of your favorites? Oh, sure. And, and prayer is definitely one of the ways that we can bless other people. It's the way that directly, the one way that directly invokes the, the power of God, right? Praying for other people. And, and some of my, and, and how to pray for people, it's very simple. It doesn't take much time, right? So a few of my, my favorites are, someone suggested once, pray for people before you text them. Now think about that, Jamie. Mm. If we would pray for someone every time we flipped open our phone to text somebody and we stopped and prayed for that person we were about to text, do you know how many more prayers would be going up? A lot. <laughs> think about that. A lot. Right? And it would stop. More than we and, even realize. Yes. And as you were just talking about the way that texting communication can often be misinterpreted, how would it guide our words on that text if we first stopped and prayed for that person? How would that set our hearts right toward that person, right? That's Regardless really of what good. the message is meant to be. Um, another one is one of the, my favorites that I had always done when my girls were younger um, is to pray on the drive to school. You know, my my um, we homeschool our middle school child. Our older daughter just walks across the street to high school. So now we don't have that same time together, but we used to have this precious 10 minutes every day on the way to school when I would drive them and we would pray together. And that to me was time. You had to be in the car anyway. So why not use that? Or I hear other people say, every time you hit a red light, stop and pray for someone. So in the regular rhythms of your day, things you have to be doing anyway, make them uh, an opportunity to pray for someone. And then this is kind of, this is common, kind of trite at this point, but I do pray for my children's, not just their future spouse, but for the parents who are raising that future spouse. I Ooh, think I've been doing that good. since they were small. It's it's not just praying that the Lord would bring my girls God honoring husbands, but that right now he is encouraging and equipping those boys' parents to raise up a child who loves the Lord and will treat my daughters with the utmost respect. So because you know you and I right now are are raising children who will one day be someone's spouse, we need all the help we can get. So I want to pray for those people who are raising my future sons-in-law. Um and then just a, another quick one which is fun. I uh, I've written these in the book because people have shared them with me, but Pray for your server at a restaurant. If you're praying at the restaurant, don't just pray for your own meal, but pray for the person who's serving you. It just There are so many opportunities to pray for people who you may never come in contact with again, but uh, just a lot of great opportunities can come our way for that allow us to pray and to, uh, again, invoke the power of God in the lives of other people that we may not even have connection with again. But because of the situation we're in at any given moment, if we remember to pray, we can bless other people with our prayers. I love that. I, I especially love the praying for the parents of your kids, spouses, future spouses. And also I love the, the server one because I think that trains us and then, you know, our kids, if 
if we have kids and if they're with us, um, to see people and not to overlook people. Kind of like I was sharing with, I just didn't even make eye contact. I saw that yeah. person. I intentionally didn't make eye contact because I didn't want, you know, I didn't, I didn't want the responsibility of being asked for something I wasn't willing to give. I didn't want to take the time, but it trains us to see them and to give in some way and, and to realize that even if we don't, give anything that they will ever see or tangibly receive other than hopefully a good tip because that's just the right <laughs> thing to do exactly um, but we that we see them and that you know even if they don't hear that prayer which they probably won't that, that it's like that idea of sowing into something that you have faith will bring some kind of fruit that it will go out and not return empty even if you don't see it and, and just to see people in that way. I love that. So thanks mm -hmm. for that reminder. Yeah. Well, Becky, what, uh, where can our listeners go to connect with you online and on social media? Oh, thanks for asking. You can find me at beckykopitsky.com. That's my website for my book readers. I also do a lot of coaching for other writers and speakers, and that's at theinspiredbusiness.co. But if you're a woman who just loves to pray and loves to follow the Lord and wants more encouragement and how to do that, then more information about my books is on my website, beckykopitsky.com. And that's also my socials just under my name on Facebook, wow. on Instagram. I actually don't do a whole lot on organic socials, but I love to connect with new people. And so um, feel free to sign up for my email list or just send me a, a little message on Instagram or Facebook messenger. And I would love to hear from you. That's great. Well, how can we pray for you today? And I'll close this in prayer. Oh, thank you. I would just treasure your prayers that I'd continue to walk in the center of God will, God's will. That's always my prayer. In the way I serve my family, the way I serve my clients, the way I generate messages through God's calling to share with others, I just want to be in the center of his will because we can't go wrong as long as we're in that space. Absolutely. Well, Becky, thank you so much for being here. It's just Thank great you. To, to get to talk about this amazing book. And yeah. yeah, there was so much more we didn't get to. So I guess people are just going to have to buy the book and find out because <laughs> there's so many. Just like if you want a book that's going to just fill you with hope and encouragement, um, that this that's what this book does. It is so, mm. so full of inspiration and encouragement. So thank you. Thank you, Jamie. I appreciate you. All right. Well, let's pray. God, we just thank you so much for this time to just focus on kindness and, and to remember this story, which Becky talks about in the book, about the loaves and the fish, that when we lay our small, what seems to us to be our small acts of kindness and, and just laying these, um, these actions, these thoughts, these prayers at Jesus' feet, that he multiplies them just like he did the loaves and the fish to the point where they will bless countless more people than we could ever dream or imagine. And we just pray that God in Jesus name, that you would just be present with us, help us to go forth out of this time with a renewed faith in our ability to change the world through our kindness, through our prayers, through our just seeing people that might feel unseen that we can really be the hands and the feet of Jesus, that we can be a representation of, of your love, Father, through the things that we do in the people around us. And I love this reminder not to ignore the people in our immediate sphere of our families. Those can be the ones we overlook the most, our husbands, our kids, our family members. Um, we just pray that you would help us, just equip us with the right heart to go about this. Help us to just be mindful Give us those reminders and prompt us to, to remember to be kind to these people. We just lift Becky up to you and specifically pray that you would continue to keep her in your will for her, whatever she's doing, for her coaching and training, for writing, um, for speaking, for ministry, for all of the things, for parenting, for being a wife for being a friend and family member, God, that in each of these areas that there would be no either or, that you would equip her for every single thing that you've called her to, and that she would be just walking out these things um, absolutely firmly in your will. 
and that she would begin to see the fruit. I know we don't always get to see it, but I just pray, God, that you would just help her um, to see some of the fruit, the glimpses of the fruit of these things that she's doing, to just encourage her to take the next steps of obedience. Lord, we just pray that you would surround her with um, with just protection from the enemy, just that she would be protected from any of um, any of his attacks as she works for your kingdom. We know that all of us become targets as we try to do the things that you've set before us and that there will be obstacles, there will be attacks, there will be difficulties. But God, we know that Jesus has already overcome the world, that he's already victorious over those things. And so I just pray that Becky would walk in that confidence and that you would just continue to guide her and direct her next steps in each of these areas. Lord, we just pray your blessing on her. And we pray for this book, God, this beautiful book that you would open doors that she thought were closed, that you would just expand the reach of this book and just allow um, more people than she ever, ever could have thought to be able to read this and, and that it would point people to you, God, and that it would literally change the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.